Contingent valuation, uh, very controversial, but also very uh, attractive, is the top class. And for top class, I mean top class is the most popular. If you go on Google and you go a uh, Google research about valuation method, that's for sure a top class. So it's the most used methods for valuing environmental ecosystem services and environmental resources. Uh, it's a survey method, we said uh, already. Uh, so we need a survey and the survey um, provide a direct method of talking with people with people. Why direct? Because in the reveal preference, we use the market to understand the preferences. In this case, we just ask. And they say what is the, uh, the value. Use and no news is up to the researcher to get use and no news. It's not because you use contingent valuation, you get both. Uh, it's important for me to clarify now that we can see the contingent valuation, a mono attributes, sounds a bit awkward, uh, but I'll clarify why is a mono attributes survey method. Why is a mono attributes uh, method? Because later on we will discuss the choice modeling and the choice modeling is the multi attributes valuation method. Uh, what's the implication that the contingent valuation is just a special case of choice modeling. Or let's say properly, this is how we can see a contingent valuation. In reality, contingent valuation develop in one specific context, choice modeling in another, and nowadays we try to make them together, okay? They have different uh, histories, but we can see them one embedded in the other. So where the contingent valuation come from, again, US, we are in the 60s and we are already in, uh, well, the setting is still the same. I have to handle uh, natural resources, mainly parks in this case. It was how we could uh, deal with the repopulation, uh, repopulation program about birds. Again, I've got a natural reserves. I have to justify to the government, should I invest to repopulate or to maintain a certain number of species, uh, especially uh, in uh, uh, considering the attention that people going hunting might have on this type of uh, services. So the question was again of the manager, how should I go about this? And the suggestion of Davis is the first economist was just ask. You go to the people going hunting and you ask them, how much are you willing to pay as an extra on your license for hunting if I keep the population, I increase the population from here to there? Simple like this. Uh, intuition, we are in the 60s, okay? But then for many years, there was nothing about the contingent valuation. So the intuition of asking directly to the people was set up. It was quite uh, clear the setting because I do a program uh, is uh, dedicated to a specific subgroup of the population, people enjoying for shooting at the birds. Uh, how should I collect? Uh, I could retrieve the willingness to pay and increase in the license. So quite a simple uh, starting to deal with the contingent valuation. So for many years, nothing about the contingent valuation. So it was hidden somewhere in, uh, in the mind of some researcher. We are in the 90s. And unfortunately, in the 90s, we have one of the first uh, famous uh, oil spill. This is the uh, coast of the Alaska, is the Exxon Valdez uh, oil tank. And what happened, they were traveling to towards uh, well, uh, the, the coast, and they didn't know, at that time the technology was not so developed, they didn't know about the icebergs. So unfortunately they hit the iceberg, the oil tank had a spill, and all the oil ended up mainly in the coast of uh, Alaska. Um, Alaska was not happy about this, so they decide to employ, uh, well, first of all, to have lawyers, and the lawyers decide to have economists to make sure that the compensation, that's the first point that we, uh, we made at the beginning of this course, uh, the Alaska wanted to be sure that the compensation was covering use and no use 
uh, value of their environment, okay? So they appointed two economists. Uh, at that time, they were not very famous. Now they're very famous, Mitchell and Carson. And they had to come up with a number, and the number had to go in front of a court for a liability, a compensation that the Exxon Valdez had to provide to the government to offset the disaster, okay? So these researchers, of course, they straight went to use the travel cost. So it was the uh, loss of people using the coast for recreation. The travel cost was the first one. But then they found somewhere in the literature this idea of the contingent valuation. So they set up a questionnaire, they collected data, and they said, oh, the losses is quite substantial. I don't remember the billions of dollars compensation that they ask, um, but it was for a claim. And so the Exxon Valdez, of course, it was not sitting and waiting for these big numbers to come through. So they decided to appoint someone else, and they appointed uh, Ausman, we will see that he's still playing a role on this, to, um, to battle these numbers, to say that this number doesn't make any sense. What the people do know about the value of the environment or the no news value of the environment. So there was this uh, interesting battle about is valid, is not valid, and so all this uh, con controversy in a law court. So they had to settle <laughs> the situation they have to appoint a panel of experts that is called the Blue uh, Ribbon Panel. And this panel, uh, they, uh, the panel was uh, a pool of experts. Two of them, they had Nobel Prizes and, uh, in economics, of course. And they had to discuss, is valid or is not valid? So uh, was set up this meeting, and the conclusion was, yes, it's a valid method to assess the total economic value of their environment. However, however, is valid under a set number of rules, okay? So from since 90s, the content valuation uh, quest, uh, methodology became so famous because, of course, a top expert in the world said this was a valid method to assess the environment. So this is the beginning of the content valuation, and the guidelines that they provided back on in the 90s remain they are still valid, to be honest. They have been refreshed and revamped a couple of years ago, but they are still valid. These guidelines, and we will go through these guidelines slowly uh, now, uh, the guidelines are very strict, very, very strict, when you want to do a content evaluation for environmental liability. So when you do a content evaluation for cost-benefit analysis, to set a policy instrument, to do other type of assessment, you can be a bit more relaxed about the rules, okay? Uh, but the rules are very clear, and the rules are this design of the market has to be conservative, so you have to be careful about do not overestimate. We will see exactly what does it mean. Uh, you cannot ask open question, how much are you willing to pay? You are not supposed to ask, how much are you willing to be compensated? That you might immediately say, what does it mean? I've got an oil spill in my country, and do you ask me to pay? We will discuss this in a bit. Uh, the description of this market has to be very clear and simple, so it cannot be done overnight by a couple by a, a researcher and then go collect the data and claim that is valid. So it's a big, long process of preparation. Um, you ask people to pay. You have to be clear about how, when, for how long, who is dealing with this money, what is doing. So all these details need to be clear. And this is a clear, easy uh, rule of thumb to assess uh, contingent valuation studies. If you go in the literature, you uh, check how the uh, researchers set the questions in the study, and when you see that there is no payment vehicle, no institute, no length of time of the payment, is a questionnaire that has been done by someone that it doesn't know anything about contingent evaluation. So that results are maybe good for a fire in one night in the field, and that's it, okay? So we have to be very careful about this, because again, this, this impression is very easy to write a questionnaire but you have to be 
careful about how you do it. People do answer the question, okay? So I come to you and say, can you give me 10 pounds to protect the birds in Chingaza? He's a nice person, he said yes or no, according to his willingness to pay, but uh, what does it mean? How should he pay me? Who is do what I'm doing with that money for how long and all the rest of it? This has to be, it's a market. I have to set up a market with all the feature, features of a market. So everything has to be, it's a sort of contract, okay? So we are in a contract and you need to know what you uh, sign in this contract, okay? So that has to be done by the uh, researcher. Uh, a lot of pre-testing in the, que in the questionnaire, so you have to test this way you set up the market. Uh, you have to be careful about no answer, because people can say, we have discussed in this day, people have ethical position, so I say, I don't want to pay, but not because I don't care, I don't want to pay because of an ethical position. So this respondent is what we can call a protest opinion. Why it is important a protest opinion? Because if I consider someone that has a zero value, a protest is someone that said, no, I don't want to pay anything. And if I include a lot of people with zero in a database, do you know what zero does on a mean? Lower down, lower down the value, okay? So of course, I need to be sure that the zeros are through zero is, is mm, valid to say zero because I don't care, that's fine. But if I don't care because I hate the government, I don't trust the managers or whatever, that's a different type of zeros, okay? So this is very important. Uh, conclusion, the questionnaire of a content evaluation questionnaire is not a standard one, is a Questionnaire that differ from the content, from the questionnaire that the statistician, social scientist, or whoever is setting a questionnaire would do. So you need to know what you are doing. So these are the 90s. Since the 90s, we have already 1995. 2,000 studies using continuous evaluation. In 2001, we had more than 5,000 studies using continuous evaluation, and we can and spread across more than 100 countries, and we can continue uh, on this. Uh, is a standard methodology in different organizations, uh, local, international level. We have to admit that it's mainly used by um, Americans, Australian, and UK. Europe, South America, other places is coming through. It not, was not popular uh, for many, many years. Now it's changing. Uh, so does it mean that it's an accepted method? It's not. This is a 2012 um, journals of the American Economic Association. And this journal uh, reports three articles about the continuum evaluation. So it's a dedicated session on continuum evaluation. We have, not surprisingly, a paper by Carson that is saying is the best method ever, is a success, and will be even more a success. Uh, then there is uh, another paper of other three uh, economists that they are still supportive and they say the continuum evaluation is a good method, let's use it. They make their case about when it's not good. However, there is a name that we saw before, Hausmann. Hausmann is the one that was employed by Exxon in the 90s to battle that is not uh, good. And he's coming with a conclusion that is quite scary. He said, okay, it was doubtful that we could get number. Now he's sure that we can do it. Okay, so it's the end of the continuum evaluation and he's making his case. So despite it's very, very used, there are a lot of criticisms are still going on. And the... Uh, and this is 2012. In 2017, um, 2015, there is the Gulf of Mexico oil spill. So the same setting of 1993. Uh, we have, again, a pool of experts. that they, are, they need to assess the damage uh, of this oil spill. They are using contingent evaluation. This is 2017 um, science paper. Uh, of course, Carson is one of the authors, he's not the first, but he's a, all the big names about continuum evaluation are the authors of this paper. And, and, and they come up with big numbers again, and they say, this is what, uh, I don't remember the oil company this time, anyhow, uh, Shell. 
BP, 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 BP uh, have to pay for the has to pay for this disaster. Okay, so this is what the economy supported in contingent evaluation. Uh, said in 2017 in the science paper, immediately after the BP is funding this book, and is, this book is uh, authored by a Nobel Prize, McFadden, and his uh, disciple, let's say, train. Uh, 19 out of 21 chapters of the book are uh, paid by BP to write this book, and guess what? What do they say? as you can imagine. <laughs> They're quite honest because if you look at the title, the title is quite vague because content evaluation, uh, a complementary critique, but when you open the book, they clarify that the critique is mainly about the non-use value that you can get from a contingent evaluation. But you have to look carefully, because if you got, just look at the book, you get the impression that all the methodology is wrong, okay? The only chapter that is not a pay in this book is the one by McFadden, it's a Nobel Prize, so maybe he didn't care about the big money. And it's very clear in his chapter saying, well, there are different uh, rules that you have to follow, but if you do follow these rules, contingent evaluation, do uh, produce value that are reliable for the use component of the ecosystem services or the environmental uh, damages. When you do value the non-use component, is also a bit uh, un unsure about the results, okay? However, uh, if you read the book, is done very well to criticize strongly the methods. Despite this, people continue to use the conscious evaluation method, but to say that we have to be careful about what we do. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I miss playing with the slides, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> uh, what is important for us is not the success or failure of the method. It's important to know that there is this quite robust uh, knowledge how to do a proper content evaluation when you estimate use value of ecosystem services. So we do get, if you do a proper job, uh, measurements that can be used in policy decision making. Uh, there is a bit more criticism about using or estimating a new use value, especially uh, when you are dealing with environmental liability. So when there is a uh, a low court case, okay? Uh, if you have time, there is this, uh, I think it's a blog of environmental economists from US. Uh, they cover quite well this uh, debate between uh, the scientists or the economists of the, nature of the science journal and the uh, economists paid by BP about the criticism. And they make the case that the criticism, well, you are paid to do a job, and they've done a decent job but it's a job, okay? So we can debate what they have to say. Uh, so how we go and do a contingent evaluation? Contingent evaluation requires different steps, and now you can guess. The main step, uh, despite is a questionnaire, so uh, the questionnaire for some aspects uh, is similar to the travel cost questionnaire that we were discussing uh, before. Uh, what is important and is uh, peculiar is the part about the contingent market. And the contingent market uh, is dealing with different aspects. The first one is what we are dealing with. What's the ecosystem services? What's the good? What's the environment that we want to value? Property rights. The property rights says if you have to be willing to pay or be willing to accept. Going back to the uh, Exxon Valdez case, how they could ask the people to pay for oil disaster when they receive a loss. Doesn't make a lot of sense. That, but the economists were very clever, so what they did is to say, okay, we had this oil disaster today, and this was uh, caused by the inexperience of the captain of the oil tank, because uh, he didn't know the, the sea, so he ended up on an iceberg, and there was the disaster. So are you willing to pay in the future 
a service from the Alaska government that is making sure that we escort the oil tank coming towards our coast to avoid this. So they flip the, uh, the situation to make sure that they could ask a willingness to pay rather than a willingness to accept questions. I think we, we, we discuss in these days about this problem of willingness to pay, willingness to accept. Quite obvious how much I'm willing to accept. F be free to ask me, well, to give me whatever you want. I have no limits how much I'm willing to pay. Fortunately, my salary is the, or my income is the top end. So there is this disparity that is quite important. Uh, who has to be interviewed for this survey. So in some way, uh, I'm talking about ecosystem services, so it can be everybody interviewed for these services. How do I set the boundaries of my, quest, my survey? This is a decision that we need to uh, consider. Then I have to develop my hypothetical market with all the features of a market. Okay, so how I'm gonna pay and all the rest of it. Then I have to decide, uh, and it's a bit um, conflated with the questionnaire, how I'm gonna survey the people. We were asking this morning, I'm gonna do a paper questionnaire, an online questionnaire, a mail questionnaire, and I need to know this because uh, according to the questionnaire, the, the survey mode, I need to adjust what I can use and what I cannot use. Let's suppose I do a telephone questionnaire, I cannot show any map about, I don't know, ecosystem service, blah, blah, blah. So I have to think about this. I do a mail survey, I can send a booklet, I do this in an app, it's a different story. So this has to be considered in advance. Lot of attention on the questionnaire designing, uh, control on the data, and then the data analysis. Data analysis, I, I can say that is quite simple, it's not, we will see in a second. Okay, property right. Uh, the property right in some way setting if you have to use a willingness to pay or a willingness to accept. By the guidelines, you need to ask all the time a willingness to pay. But let's suppose we are dealing with, um, that is quite relevant for, uh, for Bogota, hair pollution in the city, okay? So uh, if we have to reduce the pollution in the city, uh, are the people, entitled to a better water quality? Or is the government offering an extra services, an extra service to the people? This change if we have to willingness to pay or willingness to accept. So this has to be set in the scene. And there is not a, a solution. Every study differs. Every study needs to accommodate this. Has to be clear. Again, if you pick questionnaire done Overnight, you see that the property rights are really vague. We don't know who is doing what, okay? And more, uh, worse, there are questionnaires where people can express the willingness to accept or the willingness to pay. So it's a very <laughs> democratic system. Say something and it's gonna be fine. Absolutely wrong. Um, before, nowadays, majority of the studies use a willingness to pay. Of course, there are the guidelines. Of course, you would ended up with a more cautious esti estimates of the willingness to pay. So it's rare that you see willingness to accept. But talking about communities, talking about rural uh, uh, areas in developing countries, you might want to consider willingness to pay. And the willingness to pay, uh, the willingness to accept, sorry. And sometimes the willingness to accept is not money, it can be labor, it can be in-kind, it can be other format, okay? So there is an experimentation area where um, we understand that different culture can have different trade-off, different exchange system. And this is something that you can accommodate. Sampling, um, Sampling depends on what we are valuing. So is a club good? So we're talking about bird watching in Chingaza. For me, the obvious sample is the bird watchers. Okay, you might say, but I have an interest, I've never been there. Yes, you can have an interest, you have to consider the sampling according to your time and cost of collecting the data. So you have to be, uh, so ideally everybody he has a role on ecosystem services management, practical region, you have to be focused on what you want to get. Um, so club good is quite obvious, the population of users, Fully public good, 
is a bit more complicated sometimes and in different studies you might consider what is the um, policy area of the study so who is going to make the changes is the municipality is the uh, region is the local authority so normally there is a uh, research question by an organization and in some way you accommodate their interest, okay? Uh, how you do the sample? Sample, again, it can comply with the uh, statistical sampling techniques and uh, uh, rules. Uh, so random sample, stratified sample, cluster sample, all the names that you heard when you were doing uh, your first uh, course in statistics, they're still very valid. Reality differ. The majority of the surveys are not based on probabilistic sample. Why not? Because it costs a lot of money. The science paper done by Boyle and the other cost about two millions. Two millions is a lot of money, okay? And why cost two millions? Because they've done 2,000 in-person interview with the country evaluation methods. It's impossible, especially I can give you 2,000 respondents with about 2,000 pounds with an online survey, okay? Of course, it's a quota sample. It's not a probabilistic sample, but the scale in cost is quite different. So in reality, we do go with a non-random sample. Let's wait. Contingent scenario. The contingent scenario is where we set the market where the uh, researcher is trying to see how the respondent is going to trade the money with a piece of improvement uh, of the ecosystem services. So the idea of the trade-off, I'd give you some money or I receive some money to see an improvement in ecosystem services. Exactly the same exercise that we did together at the beginning of this course. Okay, so we are under the weak sustainability umbrella. We are happy to say that there is a trade-off. The trade-off is a trade-off for a marginal change. Okay, it doesn't mean that if we kill all the animals in the Chingaza garden, we are okay. No, we think about one or two or three. It's not a total value, okay? This is something that the ecologists do not get, okay? They don't do this. They value the total value. Total value doesn't make any sense. It's a marginal value. Um, important point is how is the setting today? So what do you offer in this market? So you have to say, uh, today there is this setting in the Chingaza Garden. There is this number of species, but this, I don't know, this species is, uh, is in a dangerous condition because, and you explain everything what is going on. What I'm proposing to do is this and that, but I need your money of this amount for this stream of years, and this money are managed by this organization, okay? So you have to send all the scene. The status quo is the important one. Now, my example is uh, about climate change in reality. Uh, so, um, Situation is this, I live by the coast, okay, and I do know that there is the chance that uh, due to climate change, my house can be washed out by the sea level rise. So uh, I can propose to, uh, and we see in a second, I can propose to have a stone wall this is what the British government has done for many years. There's a big of debate because it's very costly. I can have a sort of natural uh, defense of the coast, so I have in a bank, or I can do nothing about this, okay? So um, I can provide, of course, uh, information about um, the chance that you have the sea level rise, so the information has to be calibrated according to case by case, so this is just an example. And the idea is I can do a building, I have a protection zone, and the question is, um, so this is the current situation, this is your house, you live here, are you willing to pay 150 per year, there is not a detail, okay, the, all the other details are there, to have a stone wall in your house? 
That's a continuous evaluation question. You need to be more precise on what you do, and this is what you do in the contingent scenario. But the actual question is this. So the impression is quite obvious that it's a simple job. What's the point? I can do this easily. Um, so the job of the respondent is just to say yes and no. Simple. Try to remember this picture for a moment, and then I, I'm going to ask you a few technical questions. Okay? Um, in this example, you see I'm saying you are going to pay to protect your house with that infrastructure through an increase of 150 pounds per year, now on, on top of your local uh, council tax. Okay? So I'm using a tax vehicle. Uh, Payment vehicle is not neutral, so people do not like taxes. Simple like this. So is it appropriate to use a tax, or is it better to use another payment vehicle? This is something that you need to ask yourself as a researcher when you set up a questionnaire. And actually, you have to test it with a number of stakeholders. So you can use, of course, taxes. You can use water bill, waste fees, donation, entrance fees. The question is, it depends on your case study. What is very important to remember, results are not independent from the payment vehicle. So again, you can bias your results if you don't test this carefully, okay? Uh, and this also depend, case, the, can depends on case by case, what we are dealing with. For example, water bill, uh, just to give you uh, an intuition, is the most popular payment vehicle in UK. And I'll tell you why it's the most popular. Because in UK, there is a social benefit system. So if you are in the lower end of the uh, income distribution, you receive benefits. If you re receive benefits, you don't pay the council tax. Um, so if we use a council, a council tax as a payment vehicle, you immediately exclude the people that they are on benefits but they have a say, so it's good to have their say. So the water bill is the only bill that everyone in UK has to pay. That's why it's the most popular. It, it might not uh, function in other places, okay? Yes, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> How do you make the testing of the different um, payment vehicles? Normally in a focus group. Normally, it's a focus group. So you have a set of stakeholders. You might have previous studies. So you see what has been done in previous studies, and you use this. Or otherwise, is uh, um, stakeholders. For example, uh, um, management of many natural resources, the entrance, entrance fees is the obvious one. In UK, you don't pay an entrance fees to go to a natural park. But they do have the parking fees that is normally a uh, uh, compulsory fee that you have to pay if you visit. So natural resources in UK is equal to increase in parking fees. In other places, different. I don't know. So it depends case by case, and it's a stakeholder consultation normally. Um, so you have to do this carefully. Then you have to define how you want to do your survey. We said there are many ways, and this is important because then you can calibrate how you present the information, how you set the questions, and so on and so forth. My previous question, uh, it was, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm telling this uh, afterwards. So how we set up the questionnaire. The questionnaire equally to the travel cost, it's better to have some warm-up questions. Then normally there is the scenario, then the willingness to pay socioeconomic uh, questions. This again can be used, the structure of the questionnaire can be used as a rule of thumb to understand who has done the questionnaire. Okay? Questionnaire developed by non-economists, they have two million questions, and at the end, the contingent valuation. And you can ask your, well, you can uh, question yourself. What do you want to get from this questionnaire? If the answer is the contingent valuation, why is the last question? <laughs> Put it a bit high, higher up in the, in the ranking. There is, uh, so there is an order that is better to, uh, to follow, OK? Because at the end of the, uh, of the questionnaire, people are exhausted. So it's better if you ask how much is your income, because they might be exhausted and say, yes, it's this level, because they, they don't want to hear any more about you. Okay? So there is a flow of questions that is better to, uh, 
to follow. Um, and now we are going back to the example that we presented before. My example about the sea level rise was, are you willing to pay 150 uh, pound per year as an increase in your local tax for me to build in a stone wall to protect your house, okay? So I asked them to use a referendum format. Is the only way of doing it? Of course it's not. So there are many different ways you can set this elicitation mechanism, okay? And these different mechanisms, um, they also differ in how easy they are to be set up, in how easy they are in to be analyzed, uh, despite the guidelines always suggest the referendum format, okay? Uh, there are different reasons for this, but still researchers do not use the referendums all the time, and there are good reasons for this, okay? I'll tell you in a second. So open-ended is still the best, uh, oh, the very popular mechanism. Uh, why is, is very popular? Because let's suppose I want to know some Something about Bogota, I want to protect your landscape, I want to improve your water quality, how much are you willing to pay? Easy, each of you uh, can give me a number, that number in theory is your maximum willingness to pay, so very informative, I get immediately what I want to get, the maximum willingness to pay, uh, to analyze, is the average, so it's very simple. I have to test if income is significant, I'm doing a regression, uh, however there are side effects. Uh, with this method, you can get a lot of extreme values, a lot of zeros. I don't know how much I would pay. I have no idea. Uh, or people that say I would pay a lot of money. Why is this? Because how often do you go in the market and you, uh, you buy the, the, your food or services in this setting? Normally, you go to the shop and there is a price. Get it or, or not, okay? So the problem is this setting is obvious, for the respondent, is ideal for the respondent, but sometimes is not the way to go, okay? So it's very popular because it's simple, but it's not necessarily the good solution. So other mechanism is the bidding games. So in this case, you say, are you willing to pay five pounds? I'm still, Diego is the assistant of this course. So are you willing to pay five pounds? Yes. Uh, are you willing to pay uh, nine, oh, let's say seven and a half pounds? Yes. Are you willing to pay 10? Yes. Are you willing to pay 12 and a half? No. Bidding mechanism. We have a game of yes, yes, yes. Are you willing to pay five? No. Are you willing to pay two and a half? No. Are you willing to pay uh, one? Yes. So I'm trying to get your top willingness to pay with this mechanism. Implication. Where should I start? Should I start from five? 10, 11, where do you start is non neutral. Okay? Statistically speaking, there is a bias that you introduce by design. Um, there is a yes yeah, yeah saying effect, yes, 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 because I'm bored about all your questions about bidding up or low. Or there is a, um, yeah, I say immediately no because I've seen the game after the second bid, I stop the game. Not because I'm not willing to pay, because I don't like the system. Um, is a bit more complex than the content for the open-ended, provides a lot of information. I have some complication with the sample size. Payment card, this is also very popular because it's a mixture. So in this case, what I do, uh, I'm saying, again, I want to do some policy. Which of these uh, ranges capture uh, your willingness to pay. So now it's not an open-ended fully, it's not a bidding game, and in theory I get your willingness to pay in a range. Then how to analyze the data, uh, we can discuss later on, but it's not an issue. So this is a very popular mechanism. Um, problems. How do I design these ranges? Because if I ask 10 to 25 can be different than asking 10 to 15. So how big and how small I design these uh, ranges can be quite problematic. A lot of statistical design problem, how I design this, has an impact. Um, there are different variations of this mechanism, that's fine. This is the way to go. But, um, so this is the way to go because it's the only system that resembles the market. Are you willing to pay 150? Yes or no. 
and is the mechanism that is suggested by the guidelines, the old one and the new one. Uh, there is a lot of research about saying that this method is the most robust, blah, 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 blah. Why is not necessary the best? Because as you can guess, I'm asking you, are you willing to pay 150 pounds? If you say yes, which is the maximum willingness to pay? Is between 150 and your income. Very vague. If you say no, which is still between zero and 150. So the information that I'm getting from this type of question is very vague. So statistically speaking, uh, oops, no, statistically speaking, I need a bigger sample. So to get a willingness to pay with an open-ended, I might be happy about 150 respondents. We, to get the same precision in statistical information, I might need three times the sample size with a single bounded uh, format, okay? So again, it's a trade-off, a cost and precision, okay? Then it's not just this. Uh, statistically speaking, this is something that the master students, and not just the master students, sometimes even the PhD, struggle to get. And so if I'm going and ask everybody, are you willing to pay 150? Is it correct or is it completely useless? There is the answer. Eh? <laughs> it's completely useless because what you want to do with every single valuation method is to design a demand curve. How many points do you need to draw a curve? At least two. So if you ask everybody, are you willing to pay 150? <laughs> There is a multitude of lines that you can draw. So you, list, you need two points, okay? 150 and 100. So now, how many points should I include in these vectors? And now, I don't have a version of the questionnaire. I've got two versions of the questionnaire. So now I need to make sure that my uh, interviewer's effect is averaged out across the two versions. I need to make sure that my two versions are spread out equally across the different zone, a different respondent, and so on and so forth, okay? Uh, if you look at these two examples, okay? Uh, so I said, how do I set? the 150 or 100 question. Which one should I choose, okay? Look at these two. Uh, so in this case, I'm going from two to 100 and from five to 200. Which of these two should I use? You have to consider about where we want to go, okay? We want to build a demand function. So, so the demand function in this case is a bit tricky because we have a price and we have a probability rather than a quantity, okay? The probability of say yes, how should it be considering the price? I expect that higher is the price, lower has to be the number of yes. If you see this one, the proportion of people saying yes is exactly the same for zero and 100. Do I get a, a downward shape function? I don't, and this is a problem. Is a problem because if you design the bit vector, this value, in a wrong way, when you do estimate the data, this curve doesn't go down, so it doesn't behave. It has to do the demand curve. So you have to spread the value to capture this trend that is going down. But this, of course, more values I'm using, guess what? more respondents I need to get for each of them. And more complicated is becoming the distribution of the questionnaire in my sample. So this, again, is a trade-off. So I'm using a, 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 quest, a listation mechanism that is uh, coherent with the guidelines, but there is a cost in terms of designing of the questionnaire. As usual, there is a trade-off. So that's why open-ended is still the popular mechanism for the one that I would recommend, a master's student wants to do a dissertation on condition evaluation, the ability on uh, statistics are quite limited, do an open-ended, don't mess about the, the choice experiment, the, the, the design of a choice questions, okay? So, um, the choice of the elicitation mechanism has to be made, then you go and collect the data, add the data, 
valid. So the data control, you need to include follow-up questions to disentangle, to understand why people said yes or no, okay? Uh, and this is to understand the famous protesters. I say no, not because I don't care about this good or this ecosystem services, I said no because I don't like the interviewer, okay? These are two completely different set of responses. So this type of follow-up questions are also recommended by the guidelines. Um, typical questions, how the data look like. This is coming from an example that I'm using with the students. So I would, uh, so, we were talking about yesterday organic agriculture, so there is a ban on chemicals and pesticides. Are you willing to support an increase in the cost? So are you willing to pay organic uh, food, basically? If this cost, how much? 10, 30, 50, 20. So we have a good spreading of value randomly allocated across my respondents, okay? And I've got Yes and no, and then all the other questions of my questionnaire. So this is how contingent valuation, single bounded questions look like in Excel. Uh, I will skip, I'll skip this. No, uh, let's do this. Uh, so now we have a set of yes and no. The exercise is similar as before. We have to build a demand curve, so I have to regress. The amount that you have to will to that you have to pay, and the amount and your responses, uh, a set of control variables. I can uh, define the uh, the demand curve, and to get the willingness to pay, guess what? It's still the beta parameter, and this beta parameter is always doing some business. Okay, so this business in this case you do the ratio of these two parameters, and you get the willingness to pay. So as soon as, well, as long as you can do a sort of regression, then you can always estimate a willingness to pay. Now, this, as I said, is a sort of regression, because when we are, we are dealing with, with single-bounded responses, this is zero and one. Can we do a regression analysis on zero and one? We can. Statistically speaking, there are some implication because we are not dealing with a linear model. So there is a linear probability model, has been used for a long time, but we know that it, it suffers from it, some issues. So the majority of the time you need more sophisticated models. And so that's why up there you see a probit, and is why up there you see an logit. So you need specialized software to analyze this data. Uh, how you normally see the results in publication. So you see, uh, oops, sorry. I may help. <laughs> I've done something wrong. Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I switch. <laughs> So the important information that we need to get after the analysis of content evaluation data is the parameter of a regression. It is more or less similar to the regression analysis, a bit more complicated. Um, and now what uh, I wanted to present when the time comes is a study from Colombia and is done by um, Professor Maldonada, yes? Yeah from Uniandes, and uh, um, to say that is a good example of how to conduct a continuum evaluation uh, questionnaire. Uh, there are uh, comments that we can make about the study. The comment says, unfortunately, or oh, oh, fortunately, they're using a, <laughs> we're not in the right track, uh, they're using, as the guidelines suggest, single bounded uh, responses. So if we want to use that data to practice ourselves how to uh, obtain willingness to pay questions, there is a technical barrier. We can't do it because if I'm not a statistician, if the, I don't access um, specialized software, there is not a lot I, that I can do. So what I wanted to suggest to you is to look at what, oh, this is the study, to look at alternative methodology that we can use to analyze data that are single bounded responses, okay? So rather than 
um, go for an open-ended, because you don't know how to do the statistics, still go for a single bounded, but then use a different methodology to analyze the data. We will see the methodology in the application as well later on. So this study, is, as I said, is a good example because uh, it complies quite well with the guidelines. It's done in Colombia and it's done to uh, assess how the ecotourism can support the protection of the biodiversity in Colombia. So they're looking at packages of ecotourism um, facilities and they want to see how much people are willing to pay to come to Colombia and enjoy the natural diversity. Uh, so as you see, they are aware and they listed this very well in the papers. They say, okay, we define the value uh, and the service, so we want to uh, understand the bird watching market in post-conflict area in Colombia. Precise, what is, is the precise, is the description of the, uh, in this case, of the service. Which um, package are you offering? Is 10 days tour, okay? And this 10 days tour is compared to a Costa Rica case studies. If we have to be very, very picky, by design, you pick 10 days. Can be a bias, of course, okay? But we can't be picky about everything. But this can be, statistically speaking, a downside of these studies. Then they describe very well what is going on, okay? So they set the scenario and then the payment vehicle. The payment vehicle is the increase in the tour cost for uh, these activities. So um, they set the scenario, they ask the continuing evaluation questions, and as we discussed, is a referendum format and appropriately, as it should be in a publication, is XXX and the XXX has been 10, 25, 10, 100, and so on and so forth. So they have different values that is randomly distributed across respondents. Um, again, to be extremely picky, they use a reference point. So they say, today the cost of the tour is 250. Would you pay 10 more, 20 more, 50 more? Statistically speaking, you can introduce a bias. However, if you want to change this and also the value, the complication in the studies is quite substantial. I think it's good what they have done anyway, but to be aware of this. Andreas, yes. Why, why would there be a bias if uh, that is the actual cost of it? You are right. Because I'll tell you why I believe it can be a bias. Because it, let's suppose you've never been in a tour of this cost. So you actually don't know and your impression can be different. So it's a problem of, of course you've been in a tour, that was the cost, quite obvious. So in principle you are right that they could control for this bias if they, I think they might have information to be honest, uh, about who you are, what you've done before, so they control for this possibly. Yes, Jaime. Yes, um, remember that the respondents were from Audubon? that it's a, bird, a birding organization in, U in USA, and the idea is that they travel a lot to Costa Rica, which is a very popular area, so the idea is that they try to use some of the parameters that you, people usually pay for, or the information for the travel that they have there. So maybe there's the explanation, but the thing is that uh, com trying to compare with Colombia, maybe we can have some adjustment. On, on well, it's, a, it's a good example. Uh, that's the results. I don't show you the output of the re regression model because they're using non-regression, linear regression model. They use appropriate binary models. And what they get is $300, the simple model. They control for other uh, characteristics. is $250 for a tour. So this is a piece of information that you can use in policy decision making to improve uh, or to um, use the biodiversity in Colombia to also support the protection of the biodiversity because you make money, because people are willing to pay for this, so you make money and you use the money back to protect the environment, okay? Uh, downside of this paper, as we said, that if we are gonna use, or we are gonna ask, for example, uh, Maldonado to share the data, then we are stuck with the technicalities. So what we, sorry, what we want to do, we want to say, okay, but that technicalities, um, how important is for me to have these technicalities if I have to apply a continuing evaluation following the guidelines? Uh, and 
this is leading to my next slides. So uh, how the technicalities can influence the credibility of my measure? Because we said there is a lot of things that can influence my, so I can believe these numbers, basically. If I want to go and set up a business to sell um, ecotourist visit in Colombia with bear watching, can I dream that this is a true number and I can make my business make sure that I don't start with a loss? Okay, this is my question. Are reliable these estimates? To answer this question, there is this nice diagram that I, th I think is coming from one of the references that uh, you've got. Uh, there are different uh, considerations, and this is not necessarily something that you very often um, can find in publications. Okay, so researchers are very nice at reporting of the results, but then they're very vague in answering the question, so should I use these uh, numbers or they are just for a publication? This is also a case when, uh, uh, I think it's a difference, when you do a conscious evaluation for a, as a consultant, or you do a contingent evaluation as a researcher. Okay? For the researcher, the objective is to publish. For the consultant, it to give a product to a, uh, to someone that is paying for it. So the consultant uh, has a strong incentive to persuade the employer that the job has done properly. So they spend quite a lot of time to say, this is a valid number, okay? And these valid numbers depend on different uh, characteristics. So the first one is what is called the content validity. The content validity is, so did they ask the right questions? So the setting of the scenario, how the people was done. So this is a quality assessment of the scenario. Uh, the questions are understandable. These are all questions that you can ask when you have your first draft of the questionnaire. You do a, a focus group, you discuss this with the stakeholders, then no one can come back because you anticipate the question, right? And you can say, I've done the focus group, we discuss this, we adjust, and it's easy, uh, done. Then. Do they ask the maximum willingness to pay? They don't, and so on and so forth. Then there are questions about the construct validity and the content, what is called the uh, expectation validity. The expectation validity is uh, something that has to comply with the economic expectation again. So if I do ask you, are you willing to pay, in the approach number one, are you willing to pay two pounds? Yes. Are you willing to pay? 100 pound, yes, and the percentage is exactly the same. It's a bit tricky because your quantity doesn't change with the price. So this is a clear failure in the economic expectation. Income is another clear expectation. I don't know, how, how often do you go and visit uh, parks for bed watching should be an expectation. So there are intuition and there are economic expectation. This implies, and this has been nicely done in this publication, that you need to do a regression or a modeling exercise where this variable needs to be tested. And then you have to say, this is significant according to the economic expectation. Again, papers produced by non-economists rarely do this job. Uh, and then there is what is called ex external validity, so the convergent validity. So I've got $300, so $250. Are these numbers comparable to other similar cases? Or these numbers are completely out of the blue? So I need to go and look for similar case studies and say, oh, these numbers are similar to this study done in this country with the travel cost methods or done with a production function, blah, blah, blah. So I do this external comparison of my estimates with the other estimates. Um, reliability, so if now I go and repeat exactly the same questionnaire with the same set of uh, databases of respondent, should I get exactly or similar comparable results? The question should be yes, the results should be uh, relatively comparable. Um, so there are these tests of um, test and retest. So you do the survey uh, in different locations or two times apart in time, and then you say, well, results can be reproduced. This is the idea of reproducing results. Um, we already discussed this. Um, okay, respondent understanding. This is, again, is the 
content phase validity of the questionnaire that can be minimized in the design of the survey, uh, what for sure you need to do is to consider each of these points carefully when you want to sell or you want to give that number to a policy decision maker because you need to be sure that that number is uh, reliable for making choices, okay? So this is uh, a bit of uh, practices. There are other tests that are not um, neutral. The scope sensitivity. The scope sensitivity we will see uh, in a bit. Uh, if I offer the people to pay to go and visit 10 days in one national park, and then I offer the people to go and spend 10 days in two national parks, are they willing to pay the same or are they willing to pay differently? This is again the economic insights, but economic would suggest that uh, there is a sort of uh, size quantity effect. So if you are willing to pay exactly the same amount for exactly the same quantity, again, it's not a good sign. How can you do this in a questionnaire? It's not simple because you cannot, well, it's been done. You ask the, the same respondent, are you willing to pay for A and B? Or are you willing to pay just A? Or are you willing to pay just B? But this complicated the design of your questionnaire. So these are all tests that can be done mainly by the uh, researchers. Uh, Consultants sometimes introduce this question when the size, for example, of the good is quite problematic. There are also, uh, there are of, of course, uh, still hot topics. So the debate about the validity of the content evaluation is, st is still open. So uh, a set of economists uh, had the impression that new guidelines were needed. So the um, 1993 guidelines from the Blue Ribbon Panel are still valid. But in uh, 2017, they, said they uh, published these new guidelines. Silve, I have a question mm, before you go further uh, with explaining. This is the last uh, slide about this, to be honest. <laughs> it's just something that is wandering my my mind about uh, willing, willingness to pay. Hmm? Uh, if you have the willingness to pay and you are trying to decide uh, a policy or a decision with the willingness to pay, uh, what about the cost? the cost of the of the activity that you are going to do with the money and, and the difference between that cost and the money that you are going to receive with the, with the price. What about the cost? Because the expectation of the people that mm -hmm. is giving the money, what happened with that? Okay. Hmm? Um, it's a good question. It's a very technical question, okay? So this question is about cost and benefits. So people see a benefit, but there is also a cost. So the question is, do they take into account the cost and benefits when they make their choice? Critical, okay. Critical because uh, it really depends on your study and it really depends on uh, um, what you are setting. Because otherwise this question, I would answer this question say, you get the willingness to pay, that is what people expect as a benefit, then is your um, responsibility to do a cost-benefit analysis and to see if cost and benefit match up. Not to expect that the respondent in their mind are so intelligent, we are all not very intelligent when we answer this type of question, uh, to anticipate all of these things, okay? So it's quite problematic. However, I need to be uh, extremely honest. If you read the book, the McFadden and Train book, there is a chapter about this, if people consider benefit a cost, and you can guess what they find, okay? Because they have to find that is not reliable because they are paid by BP to say that is not reliable. And as you know, the design is in your hands. So if you are clever to design the questionnaire in a way that people fail, they do fail. Okay, <laughs> it's obvious. And in fact, they demonstrate that people are not able to do these net benefits when they make the choice. So it's a completely irrational choice. And because it's really irrational, the estimates are useless. Okay, so they've done this exercise. They've set a, a questionnaire where they were suggesting this net effect and people have to assess the net effect. I personally believe it's quite complicated. Yeah. 
So I wouldn't include in a single questionnaire. I would do separately. Alberta, the question? Thank you. Um, I was wondering when you commented about the, um, the possibility of including these uh, prices into taxes, for example, or bills. In, in this case, in, I perceive in Colombia that there's a, a mistrust in the government in their capacity to manage resources. And if I will be willing to pay some more for a service, it will just be lost in somewhere in some, the hands of some politicians. Um, I'd like to gather your thoughts on that. If there's some way to incorporate this in the survey design. Uh, okay, to incorporate, you can, uh, you can do a sort of split design. So half of your sample gets uh, what we call a force uh, mechanism, so a tax. The other half can get also, does that imply a relationship with the government and another one that doesn't include their relationship with the government. I'll give an example. Uh, master's students recently um, that I was supervising uh, has done a survey about the, um, plastic pollution in Indonesia. Indonesia, as we know, is a quite high corruptive uh, country. And uh, they, the, she ran, she collected the data just before the election. So it was not the right moment to talk about taxes and government and all the rest of it. And because people, uh, they were not, uh, well, we were expecting people they were not trusting the government in the questionnaire, uh, it was about pollution and plastic removal mechanisms. So in that case, she said, similarly to the Exxon Valdez, a uh, new company, a new service is set up and it's gonna be this service, is a private service, you have to pay for it and it's gonna collect your plastic uh, waste and you have to pay for these extra services. Are you happy to pay for this? Yes and no. And then uh, later on, uh, she asked in the questionnaire, would you pay the same amount of money if now the service is provided by the government? And we know the answer, no, okay? So you can accommodate this in the, in the, in the question. Right? Um, my suggestion would be, well, I think she has done a good design, eh? I don't want to criticize her, um, but I would discuss this in the focus group, pick the mechanism that you feel is the appropriate one and go and collect the data.